everyone. Uh, we'll move into the next panel with this. And I'll invite our panelists and um, Akshay. I know everybody's in the room to come up on the podium, please. So this panel is about storage technologies. And we have here um, Akshay Sharma, who is going to be leading us uh, through a storage, uh, storage panel, which is focused on, is converged storage the next big wave? I think it's, it is already, but let's see what our panelists have to say. So with this, I'll turn it over to Akshay. Thank you. OK, great, thanks. We also had an interesting uh, panel discussion on software-defined networking and NFV, network functions virtualization. That's more from a network perspective. This is more from a storage perspective. So we're all talking about cloud and software-defined data centers. And so, of course, storage is a key problem. Now, from what we learned from the previous discussion, it's still primarily a vendor-oriented discussion interoperability, standards being defined. Uh, what is the real problem? And it was good to see from the previous discussion, it's about the customer experience. What do you get out of it? Is it faster? Is it more capacity, more scale, more, more innovation, more maybe it's a DevOps style of development where you have better, faster, quicker, new, new innovative applications? Well, storage is a key part of this. Where do you cache? Where do, do you use uh, storage closer to the edge? Is it closer to the, to the cloud? Is there some benefits back and forth? We were hearing about things like Cloud RAN, the radio access network with localized caching. If a YouTube goes viral for a particular demographic, do you predict this and store it closer to the edge? This has more of a distributed architecture, but then there's also some benefits of having it in the, in the core network as well, where you can do analytics and data mining and other predictive things. So we've got a distinguished panel here, so I'd like to uh, have each one introduce themselves and perhaps give a, maybe a quick two minutes of, of what you do. Sure. So Dheeraj. Hi. Um, my name is Dheeraj Pandey, and I'm the founder and CEO of Nutanix. Um, we are about a four and a half year old company, uh, started in September of 2009, and uh, about 550 people in the company now. We're growing about 25% quarter over quarter in terms of people and you know, bookings and revenue as well. Um, we operate in about 25 countries and uh, we have uh, been shipping systems about 30 countries. Uh, so been a pretty rapid growth for us. We've been selling for a little over two years now. This is our uh, 11th quarter of selling. So what do we build? Uh, we are uh, building web scale IT for the masses. So basically trying to build the goodness of web scale uh, and bring it to the enterprise. There's tons of lessons to be learned from Googles and Facebooks and Azures and Amazons and so on. And we believe that there's a big opportunity in bringing that to uh, the enterprise. Um, and making it really simple, uh, dump proof, is one of the big goals of Nutanix. Uh, so uh, in the course of the next 30 minutes, we'll talk a little bit more, more about uh, what we do. But the analogy that uh, I would love for you to take away is the iPhone and why this is a converged product and why it actually helps us and why this is about user experience and so on. Okay, great. All right. Hey, appreciate it. Uh, my name is Henrik Rosendale. I am um, running the cloud group for, uh, for Quantum. Um, I'm also um, the chairman of one of the, uh, of the Thai uh, companies that are exhibiting out here, Cloud Volumes. Um, came to Quantum by selling my, my last uh, startup to Quantum. Um, it was in the virtualization storage space. And, and really now I'm, I'm driving the, the cloud initiative for Quantum um, which is interchangeable with, with object storage uh, technologies that are sort of defining and redefining the way um, you know, data lives in an enterprise. You know, what, what most of our, you know, Quantum has today, you know, most of the Fortune 500 companies as, as customers, and we protect all their, all their data for, you know, anything from a day to 10 years. And, and really what most of our customers today are looking at is they've got four copies of all their data. They got their primary copy, they got like secondary copy, probably on premise. They got a tertiary copy, usually on tape, if you talk quantum, and they have a, you know, a, the fourth copy lives in a salt mine in Utah for, uh, for compliance reasons. And, and it's a massive amount of data that, that has to be moved around, and none of it is, is, is interoperable. So, so that's really top of mind for, for quantum's customers uh, today to, to re-architect that so it, so it makes sense. Great. And Dave? 
Thanks. So uh, I'm, I'm Dave Cressy, the CEO of CoRate, and uh, what we're focused on is, is providing storage solutions for cloud service providers and then for those enterprises that are really looking to the cloud and wanting to build uh, an internal data, data center that provides the agility and the elasticity, um, the speed and flexibility uh, that the kind of mirrors what an experience of, of a cloud service provider will be. And you know, really for us the key is you know, constructing a, a, an architecture that enables customers to really build exactly what they need um, and not more than that, right? So a lot of traditional architectures are structured in ways where um, you're gonna buy a set model with a set amount of, of performance, a set amount of capacity, and what we're really trying to do is decouple that uh, and enable people based on what they need um, to architect their solution from both a performance capacity standpoint to meet those needs and nothing more than that, um, to be able to scale rapidly. Um, and we do that by uh, an architecture that enables uh, back-end plane of, of Ethernet to basically connect uh, different components or, or different pieces of that storage environment. <clears throat> So on that note, uh, what is the biggest technology barrier to get to this elastic cloud where it's dynamic, we get, you know, elasticity of storage as we need it? Is it the hard disk? Is it flash? Is it, is it connectivity? What is the big problem? So perhaps, Deeraj? You know, like everything else, uh, when you have a new architecture, new way of doing things, it finally gets down to education, process, people, um, awareness and applications, you know, finally you have to talk very, I mean, you realize three of us sitting here, we talk three different uh, languages, three different vernaculars, even though the topic is converged storage, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about cloud and talked about uh, copy data management and we talked about uh, convergence. So like big data, like cloud, uh, like these big blurry terms, convergence is going through its own a little, um, I would say metamorphosis and uh, Understanding what applications, what use cases, what workloads are, are really important and how do you really look at the whole spectrum of workloads, understand what uh, stacks are relevant is actually the most important thing. Because you know? otherwise there's a lot of fluff, there's a lot of hype, um, and uh, people just bite into these things, realize that you know, this is not exactly what I was looking for, I might as well go back to my legacy infrastructure because it was at least doing my job. So I think uh, as part of this ecosystem, we have a pretty big burden of responsibility to really educate people on let's talk top down about applications and, and things like that. So that's why we actually sell top down as well. We don't sell storage. We don't sell dollars per terabytes. We don't, don't sell bottoms up, uh, cheaper, faster mousetrap. We really go and sell a solution which is a data center uh, that's kind of uh, integrating everything together. And then we sell it to the app guy. You know, the app guy is what matters the most and they have the biggest problems when it comes to uh, lack of agility and uh, performance problems and uh, diagnostics and, and all the sorts of things that app guys actually deal with. So today's data centers are very fragmented. You know, you have storage guys, you have networking guys, you have application guys, you have virtualization guys. They're all different people. And uh, our goal is to really simplify all of this and bring it all together into one. Exactly the way I think iPhones did it. I mean, if you look at this, before smartphones, or I should just call it smartphones, you know, we had tons of physical devices to do different things. You know, we had uh, a phone, a feature phone. We had uh, a we walk had a pager. We had a pager, <laughs> a Walkman, a camera, uh, a Rolodex. Uh, we had a Garmin GPS. We had tons and tons of these special purpose devices. And then came this platform on which everything became pure software. Right? Mm -hmm. So the apps are what we deal with now. And what happened in the consumer world is exactly what's happening in the enterprise world and the data center world as well. There's a platform that a lot of us are gonna talk about now where every service, networking, security, storage, is gonna become pure software. So you don't have to buy a pizza box that does one thing and one thing only. You won't have to buy a pizza box that's a firewall. You won't have to buy another pizza box that's a storage box, another pizza box that is a load balancer, a WAN optimization appliance. All those physical pizza boxes will come together in pure software and they'll sit on top of a hypervisor which is the operating system of the next decade. You know? And on top of that OS you'll see all these things coming together. And I think, I think that's the uh, key uh, transformation that's happening in the data center. Now, if you think about how it relates to web scale, I think this is the way Google's of the world and the Facebooks of the world have built data centers. They don't buy EMC, they don't buy NetApp, they don't buy tons and tons of uh, physical riverbed or physical uh, you know, Palo Alto networks and so on and so forth. They buy everything virtual 
And then they have tons and tons, millions of servers, which are cheap commodity off the shelf stuff coming from Taiwan. They put engineers on top of it to say, go and build a virtual storage like Google File System or Hadoop File System, and go and build load balancing services and pure software <coughs> and things like that. And that's what's going to happen to the enterprise. Okay, great. Henry? You know, for our customers, the, the biggest um, inhibitor today by, by none is, is, is the, uh, the network cost. And, and the sort of the practicalities of, of moving workloads around. Um, you know, everybody is, is, is struggling to find a, a way of, of moving, you know, fluidly these workloads from, from their own data center to maybe another data center, the private cloud to a public cloud, and, and doing that in, in a way that where, where everything ideally is abstracted, both the storage layer, the network layer, and the application layer. You know, that, that right now is, is a pipe dream, you know, for, for most Fortune 500 customers. Um, they're all sort of trying to re-architect their infrastructure to ultimately be able to, to take advantage of, of, of cloud resources. But, but the, the, you know, the practical, you know, as, as you present them the bill, the sticker shock is, is in the network cost more than the, the infrastructure cost, really. Great. And Dave? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some good points raised. I mean, I think the, uh, I mean, people look at Facebook and Google and that's the kind of infrastructure they want to build. I think the reality, though, is most organizations can't afford a storage team of 150 or 200 people to, to build that software on top of those white box solutions. So, you know, I think a, 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 it, there's sort of two ways to go. Um, you can provide a very integrated solution. And I, again, I think there's some very innovative ways to kind of attack that problem. Um, or, you know, you can kind of provide people uh, an ability to kind of cobble together a solution um, that resembles some of the commodity parts that they're looking for, um, gives them that software flexibility uh, without requiring them to, you know, have a team of 150. I mean, most of the customers we're dealing with are managing, you know, many petabytes of storage um, in an entire data center. I mean, it's, again, these are more on the cloud service provider space. I mean, it's an operations team, right? There is no dedicated networking function or server function or storage function, um, but it's a team of eight. Um, and they're trying to deal with how do I deploy this, how do I roll it out quickly. They're dealing with rapid and unpredictable growth, um, especially if they're fortunate and kind of hit that, that hockey stick, and they have to respond to that quickly. And so that, the giving them that agility, um, you know, that, that, there's a challenge with that. And, and the reality is the traditional uh, infrastructure vendors, particularly in the storage space, you know, were built at a time where you know, a petabyte seemed like a large amount of data, right? Now we're talking about exabytes routinely with customers. Um, zettabytes are next, right? And I think just that scale and that, the speed of that growth um, just requires a fundamental, fundamental rethink on what do I require from my infrastructure to be able to support that kind of dynamism. Yeah. Can I add just one more thing to sure. what you said? You know, it brought up a very good point about uh, how the stuff that these big guys, big four or five guys have done is basically a pipe dream. That's very true. I think you know, they have hired tons of PhDs to really go and build their big data centers using Taiwan class hardware and so on. But you also realize that the true north for most uh, CIOs is uh, to forget about infrastructure because that's a necessary evil. It's like the nuisance that they shouldn't really have to deal with. Like they don't deal with power and utility and a lot of those things like water supply. Like why should I deal with so much of stitching together of storage and compute and networks and everything in the middle? So in some sense, the true north is, oh, I could rent a VM from Amazon and I don't have to know anything about how it's uh, really sitting, where it's sitting. Where did it get the storage from and so on? And I just want to focus on my application. I just want to elevate myself from writing COBOL language to going higher up the stack. Similarly, in the data center, that's you know, going away from COBOL, which is basically stitching together everything, to really going and writing code in Ruby and Python and, and uh, you know, Java and things like that. It's, it's like just elevation of the data center is basically the big challenge we have to go to. Great, and one theme I heard, especially from Henry, you mentioned this notion of the network is the big bottleneck. Now, my experience, there's a lot of different connectors, you know, storage area network arrays and fiber channel, InfiniBand, and all these other weird connectors. Do you see a, a world where we actually converge to the wide area network, maybe the optical interface that goes from the carrier straight into the data center and plugs right in and it's all seamless and we do things like cloud bursting with dynamic bandwidth on demand, with dynamic storage, with functions on demand. Is that the vision that we're headed towards? I see it. Does it exist? I don't think so. Yeah, I agree. Right? <laughs> but is that, the, is that the goal? So, so you see it in, in, in a little corner of, of the market today, which is test and death. 
right? That arguably is the only place where cloud bursting today thrive, where, where you have the need for rapidly scaling up and scaling down as, as, as you move through sort of the, the, the phases of, of a project, right? Mm -hmm. um, everybody is, is looking to, to sort of deploy that same methodology for, for say, um, workloads, traditional workloads. But, but is it easy? No. Right, it, and the network is definitely an inhibiting factor today. But but also, you know, the the whole sort of you know storage layer and the and the network layer. I mean, we can we can ship the the, the virtual machines, you know, from from A to B. But all the dependencies, you know, are are really tricky when it comes down to sort of the the nuts and bolts of it. And yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would go back to the previous panel. I mean, a lot of this comes back to the customer and the level of sophistication and readiness for that, right? I mean, if that service existed today, you know, would people be ready from a business process standpoint to be able to understand, you know, how do I optimize all the workloads in my environment? How do I take advantage of which cloud? I would argue they're not. I mean, we, you know, there's services around quality of service on a given workload basis. We're talking to customers and they're, they're, they're getting their head just around that concept. I can actually have a different quality of service for one workload versus another on a shared platform. How do, what I, set, how do I set those policies? So again, I, I think back to the original comment um, from Diraj was, was this notion of education and needing to get customers to, to really understand what is the potential of all these things that we're unlocking. I mean, I think the, the pace of innovation is incredible. Um, but I, I, we do, we spend a lot of our time trying to really understand what's a customer trying to do with their business and, and how can we help them with that as opposed to, hey, let's enable all these capabilities and, and if we build it, they'll come because I think without the education, they won't. Well, speaking on that note, I mean, there are standards being defined. There's APIs, there's NFV northbound, there's SDN open flow, there's open stack interfaces. Of course, there's storage. Uh, different interfaces there all being defined. So given all that workflow, like right now we tend to do the swivel chair approach. We go to you know one island, we'll provision our Cisco IOS commands, then we go to the Junos island, and then we go to the app island and we you know put functions in the cloud and then we go to the storage box and provision that and guess what? It's 30 days later or it's 10 days later yeah. and we've had manual errors. Is the vision thing to have some sort of common set of APIs and a workflow orchestration tool? Is that what's needed to automate this? So perhaps Dirich? Yeah, I mean, uh, at some level, the consortium OpenStack is trying to do that. They're trying to bring APIs, but I think you know it's still five years out where you can really get everything to talk to everything else, where you have one place where you can orchestrate, automate, monitor, and, and do all those things. Uh, the problem definitely exists today. I mean, one of the big reasons why uh, application guys want our solution is because they want to bypass the storage guys. They're like, mm -hmm. look, it's going to take me three weeks to carve out a LUN, which is basically storage, virtual storage. And if I really need to get my work done in the next two hours, how do I do that? I mean, that's the reason why Amazon is bypassing IT and saying, going directly to developers, saying, you know what, just bypass these guys, because it'll take you 10 months to really do any project rollout when you can really do this in like less than a week or something. So I think uh, that problem is definitely uh, pretty big. APIs will help. But I mean, if you think about it, in the last three years, a lot of SDN companies have, have basically died and shriveled. Technologies existed. Uh, there was a lot of hype about open flow and things like that. But there was no easy way to consume it. I mean, if, if only one of them had focused on, say, disaster recovery as a workflow and said, you know, Let's just focus on one application, disaster recovery. Let's not even worry about Cloudburst. Cloudburst is like three years out there or something. Solve that problem for Oracle, for SAP, for virtual desktops, for VMware, for all sorts of applications. That by itself would have been a billion dollar company. But we have this tendency in the Valley to always sell technology bottoms up when you really have to start looking at from mm -hmm. the point of view of top down. Okay, what is it that you really need to go and solve for? And I think despite all these API, despite all the stuff around interoperability, I think uh, each company will have to basically just focus on one thing or a couple of things which are really about applications and nothing else. You know? So on that note, I mean, given that we're trying to converge applications with storage and networking, are, is there a startup opportunity? So there, there's always. Oh, I mean, there's a plethora of, of, of opportunities here, of course, right? But, but, but it, re it really comes down to, you know, un unless you have a $100 million war chest, right, in, in the storage market, um, to go and make a name for yourself, you, you have to carve out 
a niche today. You have to understand your use case and how you differentiate yourself because otherwise you're gonna be like a one off of, of 20 sort of plain vanilla storage startups that came late to, to the to the party, right? And so so unfortunately we are we're in this, you know, enterprise market where we're dealing with real customers that have real problems and are willing to pay real dollars for it. But it also means you have to understand the mechanics of who is buying, who makes a decision, you know, what is driving that decision. Is it a part of a larger you know, decision process. You know, my 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 best example is 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 VDI, which which probably likely is the most horrible use case to sell storage into, because you become a part, a portion of a much much bigger process within a customer. You know, that can take years, even though you're ready to go as a startup and you think you have the answer to everything. You now are sort of engulfed in this massive decision process, right? And so that is that is death for a first startup. So Dave, any startup ideas do you have? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, just going back to your question on um, on APIs and interoperability, I mean, I, look, I think it's, for all of us, it's a really fun time to be in the data center space. There is this kind of, I mean, there's a massive disruption happening where the traditional model is becoming something else, right? And we talk about the software-defined data center Look, in its purest form, this notion of intelligent software being able to just, you know, the, the data center is the building. Everyone, I think, would agree, yeah, that's, logically, that's the right end game, but the path to get there is gonna be fascinating to watch over the next couple of decades, which, by the way, is, I think, how long this is gonna take, right? I mean, EMS, you know, the, well, the traditional vendors aren't going away tomorrow. Um, big market still, long tail on the transition. And so, you know, the emergence of an API model, alternatives, how, what does open mean, right? Is open really open source or is it an open standard? Um, I mean, we spend a lot of our time trying to understand from our customers, how do they want different vendors to interact? I think at the end of the day, what customers are looking for is solve my problem, but also give me choice, right? And so this and is And should everything of, be open? I mean, open SSL, the Heartbleed, you know, open vulnerabilities. Right. I mean. So, is yeah, I mean, so there's pros and cons, right? As you talk open heart things. surgery may not be a good thing. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know, again, I think cu customers want my problem solved, and I want a choice of vendor. I don't want to feel locked in to one choice only. And uh, anyway, it's going to be fascinating to see it play out. And for those looking to create startups in this data center space, again, um, I think there's it's ripe for opportunity. Um, you know, and, and I encourage people to go out and, and do it. Well, on that note, we have a few minutes left, so perhaps we can get. A couple of minutes from each of you as as entrepreneurs. We have probably a few budding entrepreneurs in the audience and uh, any piece of advice. So, Dirich. Um, I think it's going to be back to the team I was talking about, which is, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you can basically end up doing a lot bottoms up, but really understanding, uh, you know, one or two workflows, doing it right is very, very important. I think there's a couple of things that uh, I have learned, you know, you know, this company, Nutanix, owes a lot to a few people, and one of them is sitting right here in front of us. His name is Bibi Jagdish. Uh, and I met him four years ago, uh, and uh, he gave me a couple of really obvious things to think about. Like, you know, we were struggling with how would we package this because we are software uh, people. You know, what do we do with respect to distribution channel versus direct and so on? And he gave me two or three very obvious things to think about, and that kind of really charted the course for this company. So having a bunch of advisors who you really listen to, and you don't have to listen to everything they say, but you have like five, six really good guys that you really uh, go back to, and even take the least common denominator from these guys is very, very important. Knowing two or three uh, comparable companies that you want to be like is very important. You can't just say, you know, I don't have a comp to look at, you know, and that comp is very, I mean, our comp was look at data domain, uh, riverbed, Palo Alto Networks, uh, NetApps, all these companies. And then everything you, you do is like, can we do better than them? And the whole company comes together to say, hey, we are better than all these companies or not or whatever. So they're the true north based on this basket of companies they're trying to compare yourselves to and so on. Uh, I think that's actually uh, all I have to say. You know. Okay, great. Henry? I think your, your chances of, of success <coughs> in a new startup uh, is tenfold if if you start following the customers very very early in your in your thinking process. You know, I'm I'm an engineer by background, and I tend to get super excited about technology, mm -hmm. and I believe that the next you know new invention will will take over the market. But you know, I sometimes forget to go out and ask people that are willing to pay real money what they think. 
sure. in, in all my excitement. And so I think you know, the sooner you involve customers in, in your process from the very, very early stages of an idea, the, the more likely you are to succeed. Great, and Dave? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, focus, right? I mean, I, that's first and foremost. Um, you know, with all due respect to the Google comments earlier, Google was very focused to get to the level that they got to before they started doing everything. Um, and you want to be the, the best at solving a problem or a couple of very focused problems for a very defined set of customers. So back to the, the customer, I couldn't agree more. Know the customer, know the problem you're trying to solve, find a differentiated way to solve it, don't get distracted. Um, and then the other thing I think is in, invaluable um, is as you're building your company, think really hard about people and culture. Um, because again, you know, it's in a blink of an eye, you can become a comp company of 550 people, um, and your ability then to shape that culture and, and, and shape the people from that point forward is a lot more difficult. That, that those first 50 hires, the first 20 hires, um, the kind of values you want to have as an organization, um, how you want to do things, how you conduct yourself, uh, has a lasting impa impact. And, and again, I think you see lots of examples of, of companies out there that have done it very well, and you've seen companies out there that haven't. And um, you know, to be a successful company, um, in my mind, you, know, you, you need to have business success, but you know, to, to be a great company, you need to have that and you need to be a great place to be and, and a great organization as well. And, and uh, don't lose sight of that. I think that's, it's an important model for us in the Valley to, to emulate to folks globally that you want to do it the right way. Great. On that note, I'd like to thank the panelists. It was a great discussion, and uh, we're exactly at 1230, so we made it on time. Thank you. Thank you.